Uh, each of the candidates will be allowed 30 second opening statement and a closing statement of 90 seconds. And then once again, we would ask that all candidates and all questioners, please be respectful, be succinct, and stay on topic. Um, now for the questions. Hi, my name is Mary Grace, and my question is about gifted education. In our district, we are battling to bring in a quality program for all of our students, especially our older students. My question to you is what will you do to uh, better serve our gifted students and more specifically ensure that all districts provide equal gifted opportunities, not just in the more affluent districts? And yes, in, 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 in uh, noting the notes here, we are allowed to give that first 30 seconds worth of opening statement. Ms. Grace, I appreciate it, and your question will follow. So, so Ms. Hoffman? Introduction, sir. Please. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for welcoming me here. Again, my name is Kathy Hoffman. I'm a Democratic candidate for state superintendent. And my journey into politics began last year when I realized that our elected officials and our state government were failing my students. I worked my entire professional career in our public schools, first as a preschool teacher and the past five years as a speech therapist. As a speech therapist, I've worked with kids from all backgrounds, students of all ability levels, including students who are bilingual, students who are gifted, students who have trouble with their R's or their S's, and also many students with developmental disabilities, such as autism and Down syndrome. I know that Arizona's future starts in our schools, and I look forward to sharing more of my ideas with you on how we can move our education system forward. Thank you. Mr. Riggs. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for hanging in there. I'm Frank Riggs, Republican candidate for superintendent of public instruction. And in 30 seconds, I'd like you to know that I believe the true purpose in life is serving others. And I believe there's no higher purpose or calling than helping every child, every student, reach their full potential. I have served country, community, and my fellow citizens my entire adult life. I'm a proud Army veteran. I'm a former police officer who went into education because I was working with young offenders and realized that they were at risk of not completing school and being able to use live a productive and responsible adult life, and I look forward to our conversation today. Mr. Gilbert. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Jonathan Gelbart, Republican candidate for State Superintendent of Public Instruction. I'm a born and raised Arizonan. I went to our public schools in Northwest Phoenix. I worked my way from Barry Goldwater High School to Stanford, where I got my undergrad, and then a master's in engineering and I moved back to Arizona specifically to get involved in helping our school system. I joined Basis Charter Schools and helped them open 15 campuses that are today serving more than 10,000 students in some of our top ranked schools in the country, and it was a total of about $250 million of projects. So I'm looking to take what I've learned to the state level and make sure every kid has access to a truly excellent education. Thank you very much. Ms. Livingston. Well, I'm gonna get this done before the beep. My name is Tracy Livingston. I'm a Republican classroom teacher. I have taught in the classrooms for over 16 years. I hold a master's degree in English as a second language. And my passion is to make things better for our teachers, our kids, and our parents. I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Shapira. Hi, my name is David Shapira. You won't see me up there, so my staff, we're going to hand out some cards. We were a late RSVP, not sure we were going to be able to make it, but we made it just in time. So uh, it's great to see everybody. I'm a fourth gen, or my kids are fourth generation of Shapiras to go to public schools in Arizona. My family since the 1940s have seen the transformation of our public education system because of failed leadership at our state capitol. It's been 24 years since we've had an educator in that office. I've been a school teacher, a classroom high school teacher. I've been a a school administrator, a school board member, and a state legislator. I fought in the trenches for six years at the state capitol for our public schools, and I ho hope that I can earn your support today. Thank you so much. And now the question with Ms. Grace first, if she would prefer. This is going to be Mary Grace and then it's Becky. I'm ready. If, or do you want Good, to we'll save some time. That's great. If you'd like to repeat it, that'd be, that'd be the fine. The question was about what can we do for our gifted students, and I'm actually very excited to answer that question. I have worked with our gifted students across my professional career, 
And a common misconception is that our gifted students just need a harder curriculum, that they just need harder classwork. And that's not true. Our gifted students do need a specialized curriculum. For having this specialized cur curriculum, we do need to have highly trained, gifted trained teachers. We need to have the opportunity to, if, they, if the students benefit from it, to be able to go to a, a separate classroom for pull out. I don't think that they should spend all day every day in a special classroom, but I do think there should be opportunities for them to learn about through, learn these uh, curriculum through, uh, like I said, a trained teacher. And also they, they have, a, we know that they have a unique way of learning, so they need to have their special way of learning new curriculum addressed, which is why just giving them harder work is not effective. And I have, I was pleased to see in the last budget that after Red for Ed, that there was an additional $1 million allocated for gifted funding. It was the first time in years we've seen any additional funding for gifted education, but that we need to do more. We need to make sure, because I have met with many families who have gifted kids that feel that the public schools are not meeting the needs of their children. Well, I appreciate the question. I've been an education leader at the local, state, and federal level as an elected school board member, school board president, founding president of Arizona Connections Academy, which is a statewide online accredited K-12 charter school, and I'm a former three-term United States congressman, chair of the House of Representatives Education Subcommittee. In doing that, we had a special focus on children with special needs and, and learning disabilities. As I think, as Kathy knows, I'm the principal author of the federal special education law, and I was recognized by the Association of Special Education Administrators for my dedication to children with disabilities. However, in education, a lot of times we focus on students who are either falling behind or have entered school already developmentally behind period and grade level, what we call the achievement gap, or who have special needs and learning disabilities. And I don't want to overlook that segment of the student population that, um, that would benefit the gifted and talented segment of the student population, that would benefit from the kind of programs that will challenge them. One of the big uh, challenges that we face in K-12 education is we do have a whole segment of students who are easily bored with school. They're not uh, challenged. The expectations aren't high enough for them. So like Kathy said, I'm, I'm glad to see the legislature restore funding for gifted and talented students, and I'd like, like to see that sustained, and so that we don't overlook that segment of the student population at the expense of a, a lot of the other regular education population. Thank you. Let's Thanks go. for the question. I have a feeling most of us are going to agree on this one, that this is a really important area to focus on, that uh, gifted students do need specialized attention. That's different from uh, what other students would need. And uh, in a, a lot of cases, it is similar in, in those ways to, to special education, that it needs a dedicated approach. And so I'm glad to see that districts around the state are, are uh, increasing their services for gifted kids. Chandler School District, for example, has an entire school, Knox Gifted Academy, for gifted kids. And, and I'm glad you mentioned making sure that every district has those kind of opportunities uh, because it's, it's very important. You know, the, the uh, giftedness of kids does not follow uh, income levels. All kids from all backgrounds are gifted and we need to make sure they have those opportunities. And so a lot of times it's gonna come down to funding and, and we need to build on the progress that was made in this last legislative session for, for gifted funding. And uh, I, I benefited from gifted programs when I was a kid growing up in our public district schools in Phoenix. And, and it was really important for me. And, and I want to make sure that, that every kid in Arizona who needs that kind of attention is able to get it. So thanks again for the question. Ms. Livingston. Question's complicated. Yes, I agree that, that we need more funding towards gifted programs. I watch gift, gifted programs in the schools that I've been in dwindle to a non-existent level. But it goes back to, let's realize the first task at hand. We're tying our teachers to a test, allowing them to no longer be as creative as we all can possibly be. I feel the AZ merit does need to go. I would like to bring more local control into our districts for district assessments. My plan is the menu of assessments where then districts can choose what assessment best fits them. Once we give back more local con control in, in our testing process, we then look at how our curriculum or our, our needs are best met with our, in our own communities. 
The next step is the, the real problem, which is not just the funding, is we're not turning out enough teachers that are going into the special, special needs programs or gifted programs. So that in, in where is, I think, the true problem, one, the testing that's handcuffing us, and two, the continued funding, and three, obviously, sorry, three, the, um, the uh, not having enough teachers in those programs. I am currently, I sit on the Maricopa Community College Governing Board and, and former past president there. I am working with our chancellor, Chancellor Harper Marinick, and I am working with ASU right now to reform that pathway from teacher to student teacher to classroom ready to see if more hands on deck can come in and more enticing programs for our teachers can be offered to make them realize let's not just be a classroom teacher let's be a reading specialist let's be a gifted teacher let's be a special ed teacher i think what it comes down to is knowledge at the classroom level knowledge understanding what our class the classrooms and our districts actually need and sitting with everyone at the table to make things happen thank you mr Shapiro. So this is near and dear to my heart. I was an IB student when I was in high school. I have an IB International Baccalaureate Diploma. And I taught in the International Baccalaureate Program and I taught AP students. I wasn't as lucky as Rick. I didn't get to teach social studies. I, I taught math, uh, geometry. And I want to tell you, my, my view of this issue is it's really centered in, in two concerns. The first is training. And I'll tell you, when I was in, in, in the IB program, my high school, North Canyon High School, was one of only two high schools in Arizona that had an IB program. But we now have schools across the state that have robust IB programs. We have AP programs in many of our high schools across the state as well, or, or, or other types of advanced programs. So we're doing a lot more today than we were across Arizona when I was in high school, but we're doing it with less resources than we had 10 years ago. And that's a big part of the problem is not just resources in terms of financial resources, but resources in terms of training. The Arizona Department of Education, when I started as an educator 17 years ago, had great, robust training for gifted and talented educators. And today, I know few districts, few administrators, and few teachers who look to the Department of Education as the clearinghouse of best practices that they should be. ADE should pre be providing resources and not just roadblocks to educators and administrators and students across the state to make sure that our kids have the best opportunities that they deserve. And on the, on the resource side, the other important thing to notice, it is all interconnected. All of the issues that I'm sure we're going to be talking about this afternoon are interconnected in some way because we're, we're focused on this single issue of education. And one of the things I'm sure that's going to come up is funding in general. And one of the issues that we have for gifted and talented students across the board is the fact that the impact of funding is not just that there aren't resources for training and attracting and retaining great gifted and talented educators, but we don't fund full day kindergarten anymore. So guess what? School districts that have full day kindergarten, they are stealing the money from the other grades to pay for full day kindergarten in their school. We don't have nearly enough teachers, which means our class sizes are out of control. And if you're a gifted educator, you're going to have a lot of different students with a lot of different needs. And you're also going to have a lot of parents, a lot of times in gifted education, parents are a lot more active, a lot more involved. That takes a lot of time and energy from an educator who might be seeing 180 or 190 students Thank in a you, day. So it's a resource issue. It's also a training issue. Thank you, sir. in rates of anxiety, rates of depression, rates of suicide in teenagers, and we need to make sure that we have the resources to support those kids. Thank you. Mr. Riggs. Well, um, first of all, pl please don't take this wrong, because I'm, I'm not trying to one-up anybody here, and I usually don't tell war stories. But as a former police officer, I had to confront active shooters, I had to arrest dangerous felons. It comes with the territory, it comes with putting on the badge. To the question, I don't think there's a more important responsibility for a superintendent of public instruction than ensuring the security of our schools and the safety of our students and our school personnel. That, and I mean that from, from to, from, and at school, so door to door. And again, it's the only person that's had formal law enforcement experience and training I think I'm well prepared to perform that responsibility. Specific suggestions. One, when I was in law enforcement, I performed crime prevention surveys, residential and commercial, for homeowners and businesses. I want local law enforcement to conduct 
a security survey of every single school, every campus in that community and make campus specific recommendations for better securing our schools, which we all acknowledge are soft targets, right? Especially when students are congregating before and after school during busing and dismissal. Secondly, local law enforcement should adopt the local schools. The beat cop, and I was a beat cop for many years, as was my wife, that's how we met. But the beat cop should adopt the local schools within that beat, within that patrol jurisdiction. Maybe even use the school facilities as a substation of sorts. I know from experience, again, that a uniformed, armed presence is a proven deterrent. Schools need to be hardened with the single control point of entry. We need to have, obviously, lockable or securable classroom doors that can be secured from the inside. Every school needs to have, because it's a sign of the times that we live in, active shooter and emergency preparedness training. I'm a certified substitute teacher, and I've been teaching in the school district where I live, Cave Creek Unified School District, and we had that training, mandatory training, on Wednesday of this particular week. And lastly, and this is very important, teach, we need to deal with the bullying problem. I think there was, a, there was a presentation of sorts about that earlier. And school authorities must cooperate with law enforcement and with the juvenile justice authorities. When any student gives any sign or shows any propensity to do harm to themselves or to others. Ms. Hoffman. Unfortunately, school safety is another issue where I believe that our elected officials have failed us. I am looking to our legislature and our governor because we know that these shootings are not just happening in our schools. That said, as an educator, I can say I strongly oppose the idea of arming teachers. We should not have teachers with guns in our schools. We don't have the proper training or the motivation. What I can advocate for as your next superintendent is, as it's already been mentioned, having access to mental health services in our public schools. That means access to a counselor, access to social workers, as well as behavior specialists. As it was already said again, that's what I get for going last, that our teachers typically know which students are, are having difficulty, which have behavior issues. And so we can easily identify these students in our schools, but what we can't do is refer them out to outside services. We can't put the burden of finding a mental health professional on the families when we can provide that service in our public schools. And I also want to add on the note of curriculum that I also support having more social emotional curriculum in the schools for kids growing up, which would also include having extra recess time because we do want our kids to have problem solving skills, anger management skills, and th these are all skills that benefit us as we go through the school system and on to becoming professionals. Thank you. We have Becky and then Roger. Hi, um, I am Becky Gall, and oh, I'm short. Um, and I am actually a high school teacher here at Maricopa. Um, I've been teaching since 2006. I have a bachelor's degree in education, and I have a master's degree in curriculum instruction. Um, and as my car says, we have 60,000 students here in Arizona that do not have a full-time teacher. Um, how can we attract high-quality educators to our state when the licensure requirements are the barest of minimums? I will say personally, I feel it is kind of an insult um, that anybody can get a teaching license in this state. Um, I spent five years in a teacher preparation program. Um, I've lasted longer than the average um, new teacher. I've, I've beaten five years. Um, and um, this, is, this is my life. And to say anybody can be a teacher in this state is kind of insulting. So how, how can we address that when we don't have strong requirements for high quality teachers? Okay, Ms. Hoffman. <laughs> 
You're right, that is an issue that, um, and not everyone is aware that last year the legislature passed a law that made it so that you don't need a teaching degree to be a teacher. They also passed a law that same session that any certified teacher can teach special education. When we know that kids with disabilities do need, they do need a teacher with specialized training in how to work with kids with disabilities. So last year the legislature did a lot of harm for our students because as parents and teachers and community members, we should want our kids to have the most highly qualified teachers in the classroom teaching our kids. And, and back to your initial question is, how can we attract teachers to the profession? And one way that I propose doing that is by making the teaching profession more attractive. And for example, I strongly believe that our public schools should be off offering paid maternity and paternity leave. Did you know that right now they don't have any paid paternal or maternity leave? It's crazy because we already know our teachers have one of the lowest salaries in the country, and then when they want to start a family, they go to take their maternity leave, for example, and so they're taking three months off of work, which is protected by FMLA, but during that time period, they're not receiving any pay. And also, teachers don't have very good health insurance coverage anymore. That's something we used to have, but that as healthcare costs have gone up, the, the school districts can't afford to provide high quality health insurance. So I believe another way we can address the teacher shortage is by making sure that we're improving the benefits that come with being a teacher so we can attract new teachers to the profession and help retain the teachers that are already in the job. Mr. Riggs. Well, first of all, thank you for your dedication to the education profession. And I believe in raising, not lowering, our loosening licensure requirements with one stipulation, that we keep the focus on subject matter expertise. I'm concerned that too often we emphasize pedagogy, how to teach, how to manage, those, that's important. But we emphasize it over subject matter expertise. And subject matter expertise, particularly in the high demand subjects, is what really matters. And because I don't know if I'm going to get a chance to answer this question uh, later, I want to say a couple of things. One, I want to take the whole discussion over sustainable, adequate funding for our K-12 schools out of the realm of hyper-partisanship. I'm sick of it. And the way that we do that is we tie per-pupil funding to student enrollment growth and inflation. We use an objective metric going forward to gauge whether we're adequately, at a basic level, funding our K-12 schools. And secondly, I want to benchmark educators' compensation, their pay and their benefits, against neighboring states in the Southwest region. And again, look at that as to whether or not we're going to be able to achieve those goals and, and get, again, out of this whole hyper-partisan discussion because when it comes to the education of our students, and in my case, my six grandchildren ranging in age from seven to one month, when it comes to discussion about the education and therefore the future of our kids, our state, and our country, we ought to leave the partisan politics at the schoolhouse door. Mr. Gilbert. Few different ways you can look at this. The first thing I want to mention is that I think we have to take a step back and realize that you don't need a piece of paper from the government to say that you're a great teacher or that you're doing a great job. Our great CEOs around the country, computer programmers, they know whether they're doing a good job or not and they don't rely on a piece of paper from the government to, to inform their self-worth. So I, I think we all need to, to just keep that in mind. Uh, the second thing I want to mention is the, the licensure changes that came out from the legislature last year, part of the reason that they did that was charter schools were already allowed to hire people that didn't have official teacher's licenses. And so this, this new path to licensure basically leveled the playing field to a certain extent in that one particular issue. And it, and it allows districts to compete more effectively with charter schools. Now that doesn't mean anyone should just be hired as a teacher off the street. The, the schools, individual schools or individual districts, 
uh, have their own hiring practices. Basis, for example, where I work, they have a very rigorous program to hire subject experts, people with math degrees or science degrees or history degrees. They put them through a phone interview and then they have them come in and do a mock lesson with kids, actual basis students who then evaluate the teacher and give feedback on whether they did a good job or not. And, and it is very important because not every subject expert is gonna be a great teacher. But again, I think our schools are able to make that kind of determination. Now, to your larger question of how do we make Arizona a more attractive state for teachers, there's two pieces to that. One is, is pay and compensation, which the 20 by 2020 plan has started to address. We still need work there. But the second piece is working conditions. You have, uh, I'm sure it seems like many of you in the audience are teachers. You know how hard it is to be expected to be uh, great at every single thing, especially if you're an elementary school teacher. You're expected to be an excellent math teacher and an excellent science teacher and an excellent social studies teacher and an excellent everything and be great at classroom management. And, and it's a very difficult job. And then you've got discipline problems that oftentimes the administration won't back you up on. You've got academic issues sometimes the administration won't back you up on. If you want to give a kid a bad grade, if they deserve a bad grade, and the administration says, sorry, you've got to pass them because it'll hurt our numbers if you don't. Has anyone had that experience? Nobody in the audience? All right. Well, I've heard stories about that. <laughs> um, so. Uh, those are just things to keep in mind that, that we've got to make teaching a more attractive profession in itself and, and I think that would help tremendously with the teacher shortage that we've been seeing. Thank you. Mr. Livingston. Hi. Deals with two things and they're the obvious things. Well actually three but I'm going to go for the first two. One, pay. No one's going into our profession. That's why I'm working with community colleges and ASU to address that, can we have some of your student people now so we can fill the needs under mentor teachers to work with and volunteer their time? Just volunteer, not work alone. Two, our, um, what we receive, our health care, our, our, I can't even think of it, our retirement, benefits. those types of things. Thank you, benefits. Um, they're not adequate. We're, they're sucking the money out of us. Last year at my school district, now I took my husband's comp, my, his benefits, so just a note. I could have paid $800 a month for my health care, one person, with attaching him if I wanted. Low level care. We all know this, right? Okay. That's killing our teachers. I'm looking into the option of putting teachers on the Arizona state plan. It isn't a done deal. It has to go through a lot of hoops. But many teachers have asked, can we get the Arizona state plan, the one everyone else gets if they work for the government? We work for the government. Why can't we have that as a plan? It is actually possible. I don't know if everyone will go for it, because remember, that ruins the choice of all the benefit sellers that come into your districts to try to make that competitive and whatnot. But it is a possibility. It might save you money. The second thing is your retirement. I'm one more question. One Some want the retirement. Some don't. I, I think most teachers here, I want my 80 points. But I've talked to some that said, can we opt out and make more money in the short term? Let's look at it. I think pay and benefits are our two big issues in this state. The third is what you suggested. We're not asking our teachers to be the best and the brightest. So we need best and brightest curriculum coming from ASU, coming from our community colleges, coming from the U of A, coming from NAU and then working with other states so we can cross-send or cross-train our teachers easy, more easily. Arizona is one of the few states we take a different test and everybody else takes another test. So when they come over or we go there, our certification isn't as easily accepted. We need to start working with the rest of the United States on certification requirements, get our pay up, work with our benefit situation, and there's not one easy answer, but I think it's a accumulation of all three. So it seems to me there are two parts to this question. Uh, who we want in our classrooms 
and how we get and keep them. These are the two big issues. In terms of who we want, I'm the only candidate who has kids in school. And I am as invested as anyone in the future of our education system in this state. I have a daughter who starts third grade next week and one who starts first grade. And I'm going to set aside me being an educator and the partisanship for a second and just say, as a parent, I certainly want subject matter experts, but I want pedagogical professionals. I want people who understand how to work with children. How many of you have children? Raise your hand. Now, imagine your kids at eight years old. Just think of them right now, how they were when they were eight. Eight-year-old, it's a great age. It's a great age. Now, imagine 38 of them in a room. I don't care how good a subject matter expert you are, that's going to be a very difficult task for most people out there. There's no instructional aid. It's just you and 38 eight-year-olds. Now, I know things are bad right now because I've been hearing class sizes as school starts this year of 40. 40 for kindergarten. I heard of 40 for kindergarten. 46 for geometry, which is what I taught. That's out of control. Now, switching over to the how we get and keep them. I think there are three things. Two have already been mentioned, so I'm not going to dwell on too much. The, the first is pay and benefits. You have to, you, it's, it's just economics. You have to offer good pay and benefits to attract and retain people, right? The second is working conditions, which class size is a big piece of that. As a high school teacher, if, if you're giving them 180, 190 students, that is a really dramatic negative impact on their working conditions. And it's hard to attract and retain good middle and high school teachers who have that many kids. And it's hard to attract and retain kindergarten teachers who have 40 kids. So we need working, better working conditions as well. But the last thing that hasn't been mentioned by anyone is respect. We have to treat this profession with respect. I can't tell you how sick and tired I am of hearing that saying, those who can't do, teach. And I hear a lot of people stand up. When I was in the legislature, I heard a lot of people say, well, in Finland, you know, their education system is, is so great, and, you know, their pay is roughly what ours is. Well, you know, Finland's economics are a little bit different, and in Finland, teachers are among the higher paid professions. But in Finland, teachers are the top of the food chain. Teachers are the most respected professionals in that country. And that's how it should be here as well, especially from our leaders at the state capitol. Thank you for your responses. I believe we have time for one more question. It would be uh, like a 30 second response on each of them, please. And Mr. Riggs will give you a chance to go first here so we look back through the system. One more question. One more question, okay. 30 seconds apiece. <laughs> that includes the question being less than 30 seconds. Oh, sorry, Mr. Wagner. All right, so let's talk about respect for teachers and uh, the piece of paper from the government because that's a concern for me. I'm a group B teacher as a music educator. According to the Arizona Educator Rating Table, uh, this year I'm, I'm just an effective educator for the first time in four years. I've previously been highly effective because of my school site's English language arts and math scores. Specifically for me as a music educator, this is a problem because previously I've been highly effective. So my Group B colleagues went from effective to now partially effective and some of them are on improvement plans because of my school site's ELA and math scores. How can we reform educator evaluation to address that issue and also not reify our assessment culture? Again, we'd ask for brief responses. Yeah. Starting In with 30 Rick. seconds, because that is a great question. Absolutely. And by the way, I do not believe in rewards-based funding or high-stakes testing. And I think it does a great disservice to educators such as you to somehow tie your compensation to the aggregate test scores of a particular school or a particular school district. I want to do away with that. I'm strongly opposed. But I've got to be honest with you, if you just, just allow me one thing, and that is we have got to focus on the achievement gap. We, there's no question that if, if we really want to see bootstrap improvement in Arizona K-12 education, we have to get more resources to schools and school districts that are serving a disproportionate number of the most disadvantaged and vulnerable segments of the student population. Students that are living in poverty or come from low-income households, non or limited English speakers, students with special needs and learning disabilities, foster children, Native American students in the northeast part of the state. They're, they make up that achievement gap. They enter school behind, and unless we get them the res unless we get the districts and the schools the resources that they need for early intervention and the intensive services to those segments of the student population through individual and small group instruction, that achievement gap just gets wider. That will be one of my highest priorities as superintendent of public instruction. Thank you, sir. 
Thanks for the question. I do think we have an overemphasis on standardized testing right now. We do have a narrowing of the curriculum that's happened because of standardized testing, and that's why I support innovative programs like competency-based learning, project-based learning, portfolio models where kids are able to put their long-term projects and their work in a portfolio that they can build up over the years and then just hand to a college admissions officer and say, here's what I can actually do and create and add to the world rather than just bubbling in answers on a test. So that's kind of high level. But your question about, uh, as a music educator, you're being tied to the rest of the school, I think that's, that's a really bad idea. I've heard about that from many different folks, and, and I, it doesn't really make sense to me. I, I understand that kind of idea that let's make all the teachers feel like they're in this together, but if, you don't, if you're not teaching ELA or math, the school's ELA or math score shouldn't reflect on you. So that's the way I look at it. I understand, I've lived through it. Your score went down based on your school, which also went down based on a state score, correct? Okay. The, the ideas up here will be lovely sound bites, but here's the reality that I've looked into with other states. We can, because we're always going to have a test, we all know that in this room. But let's move to local control. Let's move to the menu of assessments, which, been, which has been approved by the House and Senate a couple years ago. Let your district choose. The second thing is other states are moving to not a state kind of competition for grades, district. So you're looking within your district. You're looking within your school. We're bringing down that test score to literally what's happening in the local area. Now, I do not think your ELA scores should hamper you. But right now, that's how it's written. So what has to be done? We have to rewrite that model. We have to get something through that doesn't ha hamper you, gives the districts more local control, which gives you more freedom to teach, and less, well, animosity for those that, or not animosity, maybe you're a little angry at particular scores. Well, I know there have been some people that I've run into in my life that are, but a more of a working together collaboration. I just think it goes back to testing then it goes back to freeing the teacher, then it goes back re-looking at the system that we're under now, and then looking at how other states are doing it, which is moving towards a district-centric model. Thank you. Mr. Shapiro? Let me say first, as an educator, I believe in formative assessment. I see much less usefulness for summative assessment. I believe in assessment for the non-educators in the room. Formative assessment is you're gauging the, the, the skills of your students as they are now for the purpose of trying to improve their skills rather than determining at the end of the process, did they cut it or didn't they cut it? I'm against high stakes testing, absolutely. And I'm really against this model today that we have where for K through eight teachers, 90% of your school letter grade is based on snapshot tests. And that's, and that's just wrong. You know, at the high school level, I think the proportion is too high as well. But I wanna tell you why that situation exists that had you go from highly effective to effective. And that's because the current superintendent, if there's one thing we can all agree on, it's that that person has not done a very good job. Our current superintendent <laughs> has completely shirked half of her responsibility as superintendent, and that is to go down to the Capitol and be the chief advocate of the public education system. Last year, our legislators on a bipartisan basis passed a bill through the legislature that would have made it so that teachers who do not teach the subjects of those tests are not rated on the scores in subject areas they don't teach. That bill made it all the way through the legislature on a bipartisan basis, and because Diane Douglas did not adequately and effectively explain to the governor's office why that legislation was good, the governor vetoed it. We need a superintendent who's gonna stand up for our educators and students across the state. Thank you. Ms. Hoffman. I agree that this situation is awful and we need, to com we need a complete reform. The issue here is we're tying the, the teacher evaluation to the test score and we are, also we are also tying the school grade to the test score. Now, if with this system in place, why would any highly trained teacher want to go teach at-risk students or kids that are living in poverty when we know there's a strong correlation between kids' test scores and their socioeconomic status? In Arizona, one-fifth of our students live in poverty. 
And they, these students have many more obstacles to overcome when they are at school. And so I think that we need to completely reform this system. I strongly disagree with the fact, and I, and I personally have experienced this too as a speech therapist. They put me through the same teacher evaluation form as all the other teachers, and it just doesn't make sense because I have a, a different job. And, and I, but I, the main point is we need to untie this where the test scores should not be de de deciding the teacher evaluation or the school grade. Thank you. These are very important issues, as we all understand. I certainly do as well. Um, we do have just a limited amount of time left. We're going to ask you to go 60 seconds. We had some closing statements made, actually, in the, in the last question. Mr. Gilbert, would you please go first? Well, thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. Again, I'm Jonathan Gelbart, and there's three main points of my platform. The main, the number one is getting more innovation and flexibility to our schools. Make sure that our district schools in particular have the freedom to try new things, try new pilot programs, have more innovative, individualized, personalized experiences for kids, learning programs, real life applications, and things like career technical education. Second point is rebuilding and transforming the State Department of Education to make sure that it more effectively supports our schools and provides them with the resources they need, especially our rural schools. And I've put 30,000 miles on my car, driving all around Arizona, talking with 58 different school districts and 14 out of our 15 county superintendents to make sure I understand the needs of our schools on the ground. And finally, we absolutely need a superintendent who will advocate for support and champion our public schools and be a bridge between all of our schools and our state level policymakers in the legislature, the governor's office, and the State Board of Education. So thank you, and again, I'm Jonathan Gelbart for superintendent. Thank you, Ms. Livingston. My name is Tracy Livingston, 16 year veteran classroom teacher. I was asked to make this leap. Will you fight for the teachers? Will you fight for the tens of thousands of kids that you've taught and just notch that up about a million or so? Yes, I will. I don't want any other office. I don't want any other line of work in government. I want to serve, and I want to end up back in the classroom. In my platform, I want to remove AZ merit so our teachers can be freed from the test. I want to work with the awful A through F compact, which is awful. And we have a lot of hands tied and a lot of hurt teachers because of it. I want to make sure fiscal responsibility is heading down to you, the teachers, for your kids and for you to take home so you can take home more money, so you can make that, that cost of living in whatever city you live in here work, Maricopa City, sorry. I also want to work with the House and the Senate because this, this job is about implementing policy and working with others. I will work with the House, the Senate, the Governor's team, the Chamber, and all business groups and teachers. Why? I'm endorsed by two former superintendents, one congresswoman, Speaker of the House, former, former Senate President, and a host of others. They know I understand the classroom, and I understand how to communicate and work well with others. And I promise that's what I will do. I hope to see you on the other side against one of these two fine former educators. Thank you. Tracy Livingston. Thank you. Mr. Shapiro. Again, my name is David Shapira. I hope that I can earn your support for this office. I am ready, and I will be ready on day one to start turning things around in our education system for my kids and for all students across this state. And I, I hope that I can earn your support in that endeavor. We have a lot of work to do uh, to, to turn things around. It's been, as I said, a long time since we've had an educator leading our education system in this state. But I'm, I'm ready to start on day one. I need your support to make that happen. I'm very honored to have the support uh, just recently on the endorsement of the Arizona Republic, as well uh, as the endorsement of the Arizona Education Association. My fellow educators are supporting our campaign to take back our public school system to make sure that all of our kids have the opportunities that they deserve. The last thing I'll say is, you know, those famous words that are inscribed at the base of the Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. I don't think the idea is that we come to this country uh, to, to seek a better life and then continue to be tired and poor. 
The idea is that we try to make a better life for ourselves and our family. Education is the pathway to the American dream. Education is the pathway to a better life. And we have folks in power in this state right now standing on that pathway. And this November is our chance to move them out of the way to provide opportunities for all of our children. My website's david4az.com. I hope I can earn your support. Thanks again. Ms. Hoffman. Again, my name's Kathy Hoffman. I want to first say thank you so much for being here today. It takes a lot to show up here on a Saturday, and I, I greatly appreciate that. My entire campaign has been about elevating the voices of teachers, elevating the voices of our students, making sure that every child, no matter their background, has the opportunity to be successful in our public schools. I strongly believe we should be investing in our public schools, making sure that every educator has competitive pay, and prioritizing the inclusion of all, of all children, no matter their background. Only through these measures can we take our state from the bottom to the top to become leaders of academic success. I hope you will come stop by later and grab a little flyer from us. My website is electkathyhoffman.com, and thank you so much again for your time. And Mr. Riggs. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I have uh, enjoyed and appreciated the opportunity, and thanks to uh, Ian Maricopa. Uh, I want every school and every student to have a great leader and a great teacher every year. And I want to make clear, I have the highest regard and respect for the teaching profession. And in fact, every time I substitute teach, my respect for the teaching profession grows. The job of superintendent is high-level executive leadership of the Arizona Department of Education in its critical mission of administering and managing all state and federal programs and policies for K-12 education and the $10 billion in local, state, and federal funding that we spend on K-12 education going to 1,500 district schools, 500 charter schools, educating 1.2 million school children in grades K through 12. I am the only candidate, the only candidate with the experience and skill set of high level executive leadership, education leadership at the local, state, and federal level, and proven ability in the legislative and political arena. I'm the only candidate with a proven record of executive, educational, and legislative leadership. I hope you'll look at my website and my record, and I'd very, be very, very honored to earn your trust, your support, and your vote. Thank you again.